Good evening and welcome to Planets and Moons Chat for um, the Open University Course S283 and for the OU Future Learn Moons MOOC and anybody else who wants to watch it. My name's Dave Rothery, I'm the Chair of S283 and the Lead Educator on the Moons MOOC and with me this time is uh, my colleague on the S283 course team, Ian Wright. Well, good evening everyone. I'm a Professor of Planetary Sciences uh, here at the Open University. OK, we're going to talk about some recent news and then get on to answering your questions. We have quite a few questions coming in advance. We're still looking out for new questions to come in. If you're watching live, just send it in on the, in the chat box. And also, if you're watching live, you will see there are widgets there with questions for you to answer. We'd like to know where you are and, and uh, what you're studying. And we're also after your opinions on where you'd like to land for the next lander. So we'll uh, take a look at those uh, responses at the end and I'll uh, let you know what people have said. Now, it's, it's always um, fascinating being a planetary scientist because there's news breaking all the time. And the thing that's caught my attention in the past week is some wonderful images of Saturn's innermost moon, which is called Pan. Uh, now, if we can look at the first picture, Pan is orbiting in a gap in the ring system. It's inside the Enc gap in the rings. Here's a view of it from above. That tiny white looking object is Pan. It's just about 30 kilometres across and it's keeping that gap swept open partly by colliding with material that's in the gap but mostly by its gravitational influence keeping the, the gap open. Now the Cassini probe uh, which is going to be crashed into Saturn this um, September I think is um, very close to the ring system for part of its orbit and it has sent back some amazingly detailed pictures of, of Pan. It's got a very surprising shape and if we look at this close-up image of Pan it really is mind-boggling. What is it you told me about reminded you of Ian? Well I said it reminded uh, me of one of those uh, sherbet flying saucers but I, I think that's a bad idea because um, if we're not careful we'll get conspiracy theorists saying that NASA's uh, trapped the flying saucer in the, yeah. in the Saturnian is, ring. Which is, this is an icy body and um, the remarkable feature about it, is that, about it is that very narrow flange which is actually around the moon's equator. Uh, so that is um, right parallel with the rings and Saturn's rings are a very narrow system of mostly icy particles and it's very likely that that flange is material directly accreted from the rings onto the icy core of, of Pan. There's another image coming up which shows it from a different angle and the, the flange is not uh, quite circular around it, there's some sort of cusps on it. So there's an interesting story there, I think, yeah, to it's, be unraveled. It, it's absolutely fascinating, isn't it? I mean, it, it's something that we're, we're sort of explaining away now, but hadn't really predicted um, before we saw it. And it just goes to show how many surprises there are still in store in the, in the solar system. Yeah, and there are just a few, if you look closely, tiny impact craters on, on the sort of main core of Pan and one or two I can see on, on the flange as well as the fractures on the, on the core to the structure. So it's an absolutely fascinating body but this isn't our work. Um, one reason I invited Ian along is to give you a chance to hear from Ian what he's been working on because Ian's been involved in the mission to 67P, the comet that Rosetta visited and particularly the lander. So Ian, tell us all about it please. Well, yes, uh, I'm a principal investigator on an instrument um, which was conceived and ultimately built here at the Open University called Ptolemy. And Ptolemy uh, was carried down to the surface of the comet 67P, of gerasimenko uh, as part of the Rosetta mission. Uh, it was on a landing craft known as Philae. And uh, uh, it was an instrument designed to actually tell us something about the chemical composition of the surface of the nucleus. And uh, we've got a few, few bits and pieces here to, uh, to demonstrate what we're talking about. I mean, first of all, this is the, um, this is the rather canonical um, sort of model of, of the comet, uh, this kind of, um, you know, it was, it was referred to as a, a, a rubber duck. Uh, it's a few kilometers across. And, um, and uh, the, the, the landing saga itself was, uh, was fairly traumatic. 
Uh, it's a bit difficult to see on this because it's so black, but uh, um, uh, we, we, we landed, we touched down uh, about here and uh, didn't anchor down properly and then travelled, hit the crater wall here and ultimately came to rest um, down here. Now we've got a picture of the real comet which perhaps we can just flash up to compare with that. That's a 3D printer model you've got there. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, uh, I, I, you can't have avoided seeing these kinds of pictures of the comet. It's a fascinating place. I think we all uh, feel like we know it quite well now. But in, the, in those images there, you see it, it looks like quite bright and there's various shades of grey in it. Um, but actually the body itself is, uh, is incredibly dark. Uh, it's a very low albedo, um, about 5% or so. And so the actual 3D printed model, which I'm holding in my hand, is, is still nowhere near black enough. There's nothing, there's nothing uh, uh, that black in this room. There's no clothes that you wear of that black. It's, it's really, it really is black. And I mean, that's it in itself is an interesting phenomenon. What, what causes that blackness? And uh, will we actually know at the end of the mission? I mean, it's one of the things that we're working on now. We're still trawling through the results. Uh, trying to understand, um, you know, what, why it's black and what its composition is made of. We have a we have another model here. Uh, it's the same thing, but this is a this is a multicolored one. And um, and actually, what this shows is that uh, there are 18 or 19 different um, geomorphological re uh, regions on the comet, and they've been color coded here uh, in in different. There's about five different types. Uh, of, uh, of morphologies, so there's flat bits, uh, well, relatively flat and smooth, and there's cracked bits and, and all the rest of it. So it's not, um, this isn't like a geological map. Uh, we think the composition is probably similar across its surface, but um, there are these, uh, it shows that if you get up close to a, a body like this, you can study it in great detail and uh, understand things that you, you wouldn't uh, have realized if you, if you hadn't have done that. Okay, so despite being black, it's mostly water ice. Well, it's mostly empty space, isn't it? Because it's got a very low density, but the solid material is mostly water ice, but there's other stuff there as well, which ends up on the surface, making it so dark. Is that still uh, correct? Uh, well, it, that, that's interesting. I mean, you know, what does it look like if you went all the way through it? Is it black all the way through it? Actually, we don't, we don't really know the answer to that. Um, we don't know to what extent there is uh, processing on the surface. I mean, clearly there must be some. Um, but one thing you'll notice is uh, for a body that is notionally contains a lot of water, uh, it's not bright, it's not shining like a, like a, a snowball might. Um, and this shows that actually uh, the, 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 the water is um, beneath the surface. Now if you think about a, a body like a, a comet, um, uh, it, it's on an elliptical orbit and uh, it spends quite a lot of its time uh, far away from the sun. At that point it's very cold, it doesn't have a tail or anything like that. And uh, everything that's in it is dust, including the water, because the water is ice, which is sort of dust. Um, as it comes into the inner solar system and it starts heating up, and the fact that it's black means they, they get quite hot, these surfaces. In fact, the maximum temperature, I think, uh, when it, uh, perihelion, when this was closest to the sun, got up to about 80 degrees, plus 80 degrees C mm -hmm. in places. So that's, that's really hot. That's hotter than really anywhere on Earth. So it's, that blackness is causing it to warm up, and so um, the water ice in the surface layers is, is sort of spewing out and, and producing these cometary tails. As it's spewing out, it's dragging dust with it as well. Um, but some of the water actually then migrates back into the body of the comet because, it's, because the comet's okay. cold. And so there's this fabulous, fascinating cycle of water going in and out of the surface layers. And um, uh, the Rosetta mission, because it stayed with the comet for, for two years, was able to actually watch those things happening uh, uh, along its orbit. Now, tell us about your instrument now. Ian. Well, this is, a, this is a model of our instrument here. This is, this is Ptolemy. This is, um, this is actual size. And uh, with its cover on, uh, it looks a bit like a black box. Um, and it has to be in a cover like this um, for, for shielding purposes. It is, uh, in principle, something known as a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, um, but it's basically a miniaturized analytical laboratory. So the, some of the key features here, we have a couple of tanks containing helium gas, um, and that's to drive the, the gas chromatograph system. And then if we take the, the lid off, uh, inside here, we have uh, we have the detail of what's going on. Now, this black part here is is where all the electronics are, and um, 
And inside here we have uh, a, a device called a mass spectrometer, and that actually determines the masses of the compounds that we analyze. And on the basis of the masses, we can work out what they are. There's a whole load of um, connectors and, and, and furnaces and pipe work and valves. And this is all to, designed to um, take gas samples from a complicated body like a comet. Um, and separate them, quantify them, purify them, and then ultimately allow us to put them into the mass spectrometer uh, to determine what they're, what they're made of. So what did Ptolemy find? Well, it's, a, it, it's, a, it, it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, what we were hoping to do, uh, because the, the landing didn't go quite according to plan, we were hoping to anchor down onto the surface and then drill into the surface and collect samples yeah. uh, from, from various depths uh, uh, within a limited range. Uh, and then we'd have been able to look at these kind of surface layers and surface features and whatever else. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Um, but what we were able to do was to actually use the mass spectrometer in either a sniffing mode, um, where it simply kind of smells the air, if you will, um, and, and measures volatiles that are actually degassing from the comet. Uh, it also probably ingested some dust particles um, through its vent pipes, and uh, on the basis of measurements from those, we're then able to make uh, assessments of, uh, of what some of the dust particles are made of. I mean, this instrument was specifically aimed at studying volatiles, so uh, it, it couldn't tell us whether there's any silicon there or magnesium. It was specifically designed to be looking at carbon-bearing compounds, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, those kinds of things. So, um, so that's what we got a, a good measurement on. So what exciting organic molecules have you demonstrated? Well, there are, we're in a phase at the moment of taking the data from all the instruments on the mission and effectively building up an inventory of, of what's there. I mean, landing on a comet is exciting. Um, the scientific work that goes into understanding the data is, is rather more mundane. It's about you know, sifting through data and trying to establish what's what. So we're, we're building up an inventory of all the uh, chemical compounds are there. And it's, 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 a, it's very complicated. There's, there's lots of different uh, compounds. And ultimately, it's going to be then, you know, the, the real scientific interest and enjoyment about this is going to be about understanding how those things sort of fit together. How did, how did, how did one set of things form another? And, um, and are, they, are they pristine? Are they primary materials that were um, trapped when the comet formed? Have they been altered um, within the solar nebula when the, when the comets were, yeah. were being formed? And, you know, is there some secondary processing right on the surface during the actual passage p uh, close to the sun? Okay. Uh, what about the role of comets in delivering volatiles such as water to the, to the early Earth? Yeah, yeah. I mean, w one of the key um, objectives of the mission was to actually try and uh, get a handle on, on the relationship between water on Earth and, and, and comets. Now, in, in, in principle, water is water wherever you look at it. I mean, it's, water will look the same here as it would do the other side of the galaxy. So if you want to know something about where the water might have come from and how it relates to other sources of water, you have to go into it a little bit more detail. And uh, one of the ways to do that is to use isotopic compositions. Yeah. Um, so in principle, with, with water, which is uh, an H2O molecule, um, the, the H part, the hydrogen, uh, can exist in one of two forms, hydrogen or deuterium, and they have different masses. Um, and, and water that's got a lot of deuterium in it is often referred to as heavy water because it is actually heavier than normal water. And so instruments like this are making measurements of those uh, isotopic compositions. And what we found is that um, uh, the water on this particular comet uh, is much more deuterium uh, enriched than uh, water on the Earth. So in principle, you could say that the water in that particular comet uh, or if water in all comets looked like that, it wouldn't be the same as the water on, on the Earth. However, of course, all of these bodies like comets and, and asteroids um, are all parts of the solar system uh, ensemble. And uh, so uh, maybe what this tells us about is something about the ra various ratios of things that went to, to form uh, water on Earth. But therein lies a, a much deeper scientific question, you know, did, did, did the Earth form and then cool down and, and, and you know, end its, its uh, terrifying Hadean impact phase when it was a, 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 a relatively hellish place? Um, 
and then was water dumped on the top from comets or asteroids or whatever? Or did the water start off in, in the Earth and was simply boiled out um, during these processes? I mean, scientists are sort of divided on these issues. We're, we're, still, we're still studying it. We still want to understand that. But one of the key things about um, going and, and looking at a comet is that you're quite clearly looking back in time to mm. four and a half billion years ago when the planets were forming. And, and what comets have done is, is, is preserved um, uh, you know, a, a, a representative sample of what was there at that time. And so by going and studying it now, you can actually um, uh, learn something about the nature of materials that were either brought to the surface of the Earth or actually formed the Earth. And from that, of course, you then have a much better understanding of how things evolved. And on a body like the Earth, of course, we are particularly interested in the origin of life. And, and what role did these organic compounds that we, we detect on comets, what role could that have played in that process? Yeah. We should just say something about poor, poor little Phil either landed because it bounced. We've got a picture of it in its final resting place from the orbiter looking down. There it is. So. Uh, I mean, for me, it's uh, it's one of the best pictures of the of the mission as a whole um, because we did lose it for a while. Yeah. Um, we we knew it was on the surface. Um, it, uh, as, as I said before, it uh, it made a journey across the surface, and, and then came to rest somewhere. And we couldn't actually uh, sort of well, we kind of knew roughly where it was, but uh, we couldn't find it as the orbiter flew over and looked for it. Um, and the, the the reason is it's just it's just it's it's a very small body. Uh, I mean, there's the odd bright bit on it that you can see there, but you know there's a brighter there's another brighter bit in that image. It's it's quite difficult to uh, to distinguish these things. But I mean, one thing is for certain is that is unquestionably the lander. There's there's absolutely no oh, yeah. doubts about it. And it did we did re-establish radio contact with it after several months, but there was no useful exchange of data yeah. after that, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the spacecraft was always designed to operate in two modes. It had two types of power on board. It had a primary battery, which was going to last three or four days, and that was, that was f full charge when it left the Earth. Yeah. And that stayed for 10 years in space, and then that was the thing that was going to power the primary science. And that part of the, uh, the operation was done. It worked for three or four days, and then, and then the battery ran out, and that was the end of that battery. It was dead. Uh, the next lot of power had to come from the solar cells charging up the secondary batteries. Um, and now we know for a fact that that, that worked perfectly. Um, but um, what, what didn't happen is that uh, we couldn't establish a, 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 a sort of robust communication yeah. with it. So we never got anything uh, beyond the primary science sequence. But it was still a success. Oh, it's a massive success, yeah. I mean, you know, we. we Trust me, for, for given all the risks associated with this mission, uh, we'd have sold, sold our souls for, a, for an outcome like this. Yeah, we were both on the Beagle 2 project, yeah. which landed on Mars too fast and we got no data at all. So this was a resounding success. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, well, that's, uh, that's Comet, and that's what I've been doing. What have you been up to, Dave? Well, as some of you will know already, perhaps, I'm, I'm working on ESA's, the European Space Agency's mission to Mercury, which is called Bepi Colombo. And uh, day after tomorrow, I'm flying out to Houston to the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, where Ian is also going. And I'll be chairing the Mercury session and talking with people about mapping Mercury. That behind me on the wall is the latest published map of Mercury, led by some Italian colleagues of ours. I have two current Open University PhD students mapping similar sized areas of Mercury and a, a new one to start in the autumn. We want to get the whole planet geologically mapped to set the context for the observations we'll make with Bepi Colombo. And we're using data from NASA's messenger mission to do that. But it's a fascinating planet. You've got large flood basalts. You've got explosive volcanism that's punctured through the flood basalts. It's a very volcanically active world in its past. Not today, but in its past. Ah, Wonderful but, place. But, but you see, to me, that's a little bit tedious. What about the ice that you've got at the poles, We've you know, which, which may have come from comets? Yeah, yeah. yes, true. Hottest planet in the solar system. No, technically Venus is. Yeah. The atmosphere traps the heat. But noontime temperatures on Mercury, immensely hot, but there are polar craters which never see the sunlight on their floors. They're very, very cold. There is permanent ice there, which has migrated there from comets which have been impacted on the surface. It, so comets get everywhere. Fascinating, yeah. yeah. Okay, 
I think it's time to get on to answering questions. Um, I'm looking out for questions coming in live. I see there are a few. Um, let's look at some that we've already had in now to begin with. A question here from Colin McKenzie, who's a Learner on the Moon's MOOC in. He's saying, if I had a mechanical watch and I walked on the moon, would it keep good time or would the le lesser gravity on the moon cause my watch not to work properly? Yeah, well, what, what an interesting question. Um, I, I mean, uh, th let's step back and think about something simplistic like a, a, a pendulum-based clock that, that we've got working on the Earth. And then I imagine that you know is, is, is swinging like this, and, and then we send it up to the International Space Station. Well, that pendulum is going to be floating around all over the place, so that timepiece uh, is not going to work in, in, in zero G. But um, if you take a, a sort of mechanical watch, I mean, even if it's powered by ultimately by uh, batteries uh, with, a, with an electric motor, uh, it then goes into a mechanism, a clockwork mechanism. Um, that effectively um, uh, is immune from gravity. Um, so uh, a mechanical watch like that should be okay. Um, and interestingly, we, we did some sleuthing around and, um, and uh, I found a, a great website called spacekids.co.uk and there's a nice article on there about the, the watches that um, uh, astronauts, uh, NASA astronauts wore. And this is the so-called uh, Omega Speedmaster Professional. You can still buy them, apparently. They cost a few thousand quid. Um, but, but they first started we wearing these things in like the 1960s. We might uh, have a picture. Did we find a picture of Buzz Aldrin and his Omega watch? I'm not sure. But yeah. Um, I, uh, it's so sp watches, spring-powered watches or yeah, electric yeah, watches uh, will work, but they're independent of gravity. And, 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 uh, that particular watch is the watch that is the only NASA certified watch for ast uh, astronauts to do spacewalks. Um, and, and that's what we do in the space business. We find something that works and, and we leave it like that because we know it works. Um, but actually, what watches that do not rely on gravity were the holy grail for marine navigation because pendulum clocks won't work on the ship yeah. because you're changing your location and the ship's bouncing up and down. It was the invention of the marine chronometer, the clockwork spring-driven clock that enabled you to keep proper time at sea. Uh, and that was a big advance. And if it works at sea, it'll also work in space. Eh? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, Dave, I know it's you're wearing a sort of digital watch, I you am. know. Now, that'd be useless in space because um, uh, microelectronics can suffer from uh, single event up upsets. So what that means is that the chips can be impacted by, uh, by cosmic rays or other forms of ionizing radiation. I mean a watch like that is not made out of um, shielded components mm. or, or whatever. So if you get one of those in it, it'll, it'll, it'll just reset the chips and, and destroy the time. So that's no use at all. I better dig out my old Timex if I ever get offered a lift into space. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that question, uh, Colin. Right then, Dave, here's one for you. This is from uh, an S283 student, John McAvoy, and he wants to know about uh, the weather systems on Earth, and he's particularly interested in the f uh, feral cell and the Hadley cell, and uh, he's learned about this in S283 uh, with regards to the Earth, and, and poses a question, Does, do those kind of um, weather cycles uh, exist on other planets? Let's take Jupiter as a, as a possibility. Okay. Well, John, the... the, the and for everybody else, but Hadley cells occur near the uh, equator of the Earth and other planets where at low latitudes the surface is heated, the atmosphere expands and rises, uh, is displaced by more air rising behind it, so it moves polewards, cools down, and then it sinks. So you get these cells rising above the equator and counter cells further away from the equator and a third set of cells over the pole. Three sets of cells from equator to poles on the Earth. On Jupiter, you get several such sets of cells, and that's essentially why Jupiter has this banded appearance, bands parallel to the equator. But we have, in the past few months, had our first ever good views of Jupiter's poles from a mission called Juno, which is in a polar orbit over Jupiter. And if we can see this wonderful polar view of Jupiter from the Juno spacecraft, um, that's looking towards the equator around the edge. You can see it does get banded at low latitudes, but at the pole, the banded structure disappears and we've got a whole load of vaguely circular storm systems. There's a very bright one just above right of the pole. And those storms are about the same size as the Earth, they're enormous features, but they are rotating storm systems. So we 
don't see good signs of polar uh, convective cells. Uh, the motion's broken up into these, these vortices, perhaps because Jupiter's rotating so fast it only takes 10 hours to spin, but a good banded structure at low latitudes. I guess what we've got to sort of kind of remind ourselves here is that when we think about the Earth, it's a, it's a big kind of solid lump of rock with a very thin atmosphere around it, whereas Jupiter is, mm. is, is a mass of gas and uh, indeed, I mean, it might have uh, some kind of solid core. I mean, it's, it's hypothesized, but that, and that could be ice and rock, but it's surrounded by um, metallic um, hydrogen. I mean, y y th there's no surface on, on Jupiter where, you'd, where you could stand particularly. I mean, you'd be crushed by no. the pressure and the, and the increased gravity. It's, it's fluid for a long way down, but yeah. I mean, the outer part does behave like an atmosphere because it, it, is, yeah. it is essentially gaseous. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's try and take a, a live question. Um, Nicola Kemp is saying, when orbiters crash into the moon, do they break up? If so, did Phil I stay intact? Um, when orbiters crash into the moon, they will be going... If it's a crashed orbiter, then yes, it's going to crash at s a few kilometres per second and smash to bits, so they will break up. Yes, yes. Uh, the, 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 the moon, of course, has a, a reasonable amount of gravity. Yeah. It's about the sixth that, that of Earth. It has no atmosphere, so there's nothing to slow it, d slow it down. So something will hit the, the, the moon fairly hard and, and uh, yes, we'll get fairly crumpled. Um, but for the comet, there's, um, the, the, there's almost next to no gravity. I mean, it's, it's maybe 100 micro G, so it's, it, it's a... It, and, uh, and certainly when Philae was sent off down to the surface of the comet, I mean, it hit the surface at walking speed. So I imagine you walked into a lamppost. I mean, not a nice thing, but um, that, 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 that's all you'd experience. Um, and uh, so what happened with Phila is that uh, it had these kind of legs that allowed it to take out the, the sting of that impact. And then it was supposed to get anchored down on the surface, yeah. but the anchoring bit didn't work. So then the, the legs kind of sprang it back into, the, into, the, into space. And I mean, the nerve wracking thing is that uh, it didn't keep going. I mean, it, it, it actually did come back down to the ground. And that was really an effect of the very small amount of gravity pulling it back down. The Rosetta Orbiter was crashed onto it the was. surface, and it? it wasn't designed to survive that, and it didn't, but it was a pretty slow collision, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, very slow. I mean, they, they wanted it coming down as slowly as they possibly could so that they could get collect data and take images uh, all the way down. Um, but, but, but in a way, it, it? Had no, it had no legs on it. Yeah. It, it wasn't designed to land there. So uh, as, as, as soon as it was getting close to the surface, they actually switched it off. And the reason they did that was because it has a high-gain antenna on it, and the last thing you want is this thing bouncing around, uh, sort of potentially sending out rogue signals uh, uh, in all kinds of unconstrained uh, ways. So it was actually killed just before it uh, touched down. But again, a very slow descent. And uh, I mean, you, we saw the image of Philae there, same with Rosetta. If you, if you went to the comet now, they, they'd just be sitting there on the surface. They'd be in perfect nick. Well, maybe they'll be salvaged for spare parts uh, one day, or to be put in them to a museum. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Give me a question, Ian. Uh, well, um, we, we've got this question here about, um, uh, you know, asteroids uh, have moons. Um, well, we don't see moons with moons. Why, why not? Oh, this is, this is Sam Kelly's yeah. question. Um, it's all to do with sort of spheres of influence. Um, if you're a moon, you're by definition orbiting a larger body, and usually fairly close. And if there was a small natural body orbiting our moon, it could do that for a while, but it would also be being perturbed by the Earth, and eventually that would make the orbit around the moon unstable, and it would crash. So um, there's a concept called the Hill Sphere, the sphere of influence around a body, and uh, the moon is inside the Earth's Hill Sphere, so body orbiting the moon won't be in a stable orbit. Yeah. This is why uh, probes to the moon have to be maintained in orbit 
actively. You can't just put something there and leave it. It won't stay indefinitely. It's all it will decay. Yes, yes, exactly. And I mean, the, there's another interesting aspect that, uh, about this. I mean, the, 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 but there are moons around asteroids. I mean, what, what about moons around comets? Uh, I mean, that's uh, an interesting extension of the of the question. And in principle. Yes, there could be moons uh, around comets, but it's it's quite a difficult place to be because you know you've got this activity uh, spewing off and and, and sending things uh, outwards and so on. But a fascinating thing about Rosetta is that um, it actually detected uh, it didn't detect m moons per se, but it detected bound grains. So these are grains that were staying with the comet. They had been with the comet okay. for a number of orbits. Um, so, you know, is that, is that a moon? Or is it orbiting the comet or uh, just drifting around the sun in the same kinda, orbit as the comet? It's kind of just drifting mm. with the comet. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so actually the, the mission as a whole didn't find anything that it, you would call by definition a satellite. But, but there there's no reason why there couldn't have been one in there the There is past. a story about the two-lobed appearance of a comet, if you can hold that to the camera in. I mean, uh, there has been a paper published suggesting those two lobes there were originally two separate bodies which had a low speed collision and stuck together. Is that well, viable? It, so it, would, I, it could have been all, one orbiting the other before that happened. I, I mean, Clearly, it's an odd shape. <laughs> Not necessarily what we expected to see. There has to be some reason for how that got together. And it does look on the basis of surface features that the, the two lobes uh, probably were separate at one point. But the key thing is, you know, did they come together v very early on in, the, in, in the, the history of the solar system? And they've been there ever since. Um, uh, it's, it, it's still an area that's been um, actively studied. but. Uh, Yes, yes. Uh, sort of the whole notion of uh, of it being a contact binary, like a, like a contact binary asteroid or some such thing. Uh, there are many examples of, uh, of contact binary asteroids and, and binary asteroids, and uh, and uh, so yeah. Yeah, and I see we've just inadvertently answered a question that was asked live by John McAvoy. Could Comet 67P be two bodies that uh, came together? Okay, um, let's go back to some um, questions we've had in earlier. Uh, what about Alexandra Gemo's question? Could the dwarf planet Pluto have a global internal ocean just like uh, Europa and Enceladus do? Well, I think this is more your territory than mine, Dave. <laughs> but I mean, I'll I, I tell you what, I mean, quite clearly, uh, the, 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 the hot news is that Pluto pro probably does have an, uh, an ocean. You, you probably know more than I do. And it's another one of these things where, I mean, let's face it, in the, in the time that we've been in the business, um, we've gone from not knowing about these icy moons with, with oceans to, to them being almost everywhere we look. And, and it's like, well, if Pluto does have an ocean, what, why would we not be surprised by that? The, or why would we be well, surprised by that? The issue with Pluto is, is, is the possible heat source. It, it, it's, it's, a largely, it's a surface largely of water ice with some methane ice in it. And the very bright region that we used to call Sputnik Planum, but we now have to call and have to call Sputnik Planitia because it's low lying, not a high plateau. And the heart shaped feature is nitrogen ice, which is squeezed out from the interior. We think now there might have been a, an internal pod of liquid nitrogen, but does you count that as an ocean? But liquid water inside Pluto, you need a lot of heat, and there's no tidal heating yeah. available at Pluto in the same quantities as there is a, for a moon orbiting Jupiter or Saturn. A moon of a giant planet can get lots of tidal heating yeah. to keep the interior liquid, but to have a liquid water shell inside Pluto is a big ask. But Pluto is, it has this relationship with Charon, and, and uh, with the, which is tidally locked. I mean, it, it's like a, 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 it, it's a, it's a moon around. It's a double object. Yeah, but yeah. if they're tidally that... locked, there's no tidal stressing of the solid part mm. of the body. Therefore, you're not poking heat into it at the moment. But while the tidal locking was being achieved, you have to remind me: is, is the tide... heart shape feature? Does it point towards that? Uh, here's Sputnik Planum on the. No, it's on the anti-Sharon hemisphere ah, of Pluto. Okay. It's a, it's all right, a way. Well, all right. There's some reason for that then, yes? Oh, there's a reason for everything, <laughs> yeah. whether it's significant or not. But yeah, yeah, Pluto is fascinating. So is Sharon, its moon. 
uh, wonderful objects out there in the Kuiper Belt. Somebody's going to say it's Pluto a planet, surely. No, it isn't, by definition. It's a, it's a dwarf planet. But it's a yeah. fascinating body. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, um, as I say, uh, you know, a, a lot of these icy moons um, appear to have oceans. And uh, I mean, the thing that I quite find quite fascinating is that, you know, we, uh, we, look, we live on this beautiful planet, the Earth, with the uh, waters of a vital ingredient to our survival and so on. But actually, the quantities of water on the Earth compared to the amounts of water that are in some of these other bodies is, I mean, there's, there's loads of water in these, in these moons. Water's not in short supply. And yeah. hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. Oxygen is the third most abundant. You should not be surprised that there's a load of water out there. A lot of people have been expressing surprise in the moons, but where did all this water come from? But yeah. it's what you should expect. We've got a live question, which I think is oh. right up your street, Ian. Okay. This is from Heidi Barnes. Can solar flares affect orbiters and landers like Philae as far out as the giant planet? So w were you worried by solar activity during the, the Rosetta Philae mission? Yeah, yeah, on, on, the, on the scale of things to worry about, that was low <laughs> down the list. Um, it's, it's, a, it's entirely uh, a, a rational and reasonable question. Um, obviously, you have to design your spacecraft to be as immune as possible from these things because solar flares will do the same kind of things to your, to your digital watch if you're not careful. Uh, and uh, so you always have to be worried about those kinds of things. Um, I, I guess for you guys going to Mercury, it's going to be a, 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 a serious issue to worry about because uh, you're getting very close. We, we are very close to the sun at Mercury. We're one third the distance from the sun that the Earth is. And that gives us less warning time as well yeah. of when the charged particles arrive. When the sun is flaring, uh, our instruments are very vulnerable. But, but, don't, you look, but don't you like solar flares? The, flares, the yeah. instrument that I'm on the team for is the X-ray spectrometer. And when the sun is flaring, it's bathing Mercury in really intense X-rays, which is what we need to make Mercury fluoresce back in X-rays which is what we need to be able to determine its elemental composition at the surface. So it swings in roundabouts. But it's, a, it's, a, it's a fabulous example of the tension that, on space missions that exists between the scientists and the operations engineers. Yeah. Um, the scientists always want to do you know, dangerous and difficult things. Um, I mean, if, if you're going to a, an unexplored world, you want to go and land on the most interesting bit. The engineers want to land on the flat, boring bit, you know, because that's going to be safest. So there's always some fabulous uh, uh, debates that go on at, uh, in these operations meeting about, about these sorts of things. Yeah. There's a question I want to answer before we finish. We'll maybe have, maybe have time for another one or two afterwards, but here's a rather un a different question. This is from Harriet Last, who says... After this course, I would really like to do further studies, which would ultimately lead to a career in the space industry. This is a huge dream and has been for years. What would you recommend? Um, well, Harriet, you very likely need to get a, a full up science degree. And it doesn't particularly much matter what science you want to um, study. It depends on your interests. And um, one of our um, mentors on the course has given you a, a fuller answer uh, suggesting alternative pathways but once you've got a science degree if you want to go into the sort of space hardware business the open university is just starting up a, a space master's degree we've got a graphic about it here so you could study for a space science and technology msc with us once you've got um, uh, a science degree behind you so bear that in mind but a, a MOOC isn't enough. You need um, a science degree probably before you go much further. What do you think, Ian? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the MSc that we're just talking about there is a fabulous course. It's bang up to date and um, uh, it's, it's been run as we speak for its um, first um, presentation and it's uh, fully subscribed. Yeah, I mean, getting into space, I think it's, uh, I mean, when you get out and about and you talk to youngsters, you talk to school kids and all the rest of it, there's lots of enthusiasm for space. And... Uh, you don't have to be into the science to, to do space. I think there's going to be some fabulous opportunities um, in all kinds of things. I mean, if you just think about space tourism and, and, and what happens there. I You're mean, not but, suggesting people become air hostesses, are you? There, there are opportunities. There will be, there'll, there, you'll need to be an army of lawyers, uh, for one thing, <laughs> uh, to, to, you know, to consider all the issues uh, around that. 
Yeah, yeah, th th there's lots of great things. Um, and I think, uh, I don't know, we, we're, a, we're of an age when, um, I mean, our grandparents probably said to us when we were little, oh, you'll be taking your holidays on the moon uh, when you grow up. Well, yeah. okay, it hasn't happened. But I think we can probably say that to youngsters now, and I think it will happen. Um, I think, uh, and the reason for that is there's a lot of... Um, uh, entrepreneurs out there, you know, the dot-com billionaires who now want to uh, get into space and, and space tourism and all that other kind of stuff. I mean, they're driven by commercial imperatives, but actually um, uh, there'll be lots of opportunities there, employment opportunities, and for us as scientists, to ride on the back of that is, is going to be absolutely fantastic. It's, a, it's, um, it's, a, it's yet another golden era for us, I think. And we've accidentally answered Chris Flanagan's question about commercial opportunities for space now. Oh, I think it's Which absolutely great. great. So here's a question from Alice Chittock uh, asked live, if you could set up a base on the moon where would you put it? Mm, that's base a, for humans presumably. Yeah that's, that's, that's an interesting one. Um, I mean clearly the next phase of, of lunar exploration that really interests most of us is to is to go to the polar regions mm. uh, never had landers uh, at the poles before and uh, I mean it, it's an interesting thing the polar regions I mean, you, you alluded to it with mercury and, and the permanently shadowed regions uh, on mercury well it's exactly the same on the moon uh, and so the moon is likely to have relatively large reservoirs of volatiles and water um, uh, in other proven, words, isn't it? It's not likely. We know there's ice yeah. in some polar craters well, on the moon. Yeah, yeah. There's still some. There's still some disputes about how you interpret the the data. And yes, if you think of the Elcross mission, which actually um, you know fired a, or, or impacted itself a stage onto the onto the surface, and then watched for the plume uh, uh, from a from a distance, and, and saw water and, and uh, volatiles and so on. But it's still a bit uncertain exactly, you know, how much is there and, yeah. and what form it's in and whether it's usable. Um, so, but I think, uh, so I think the action really has got to be at the poles. Um, the, the, the problem is if, uh, if you go to the poles, you, you, you can be in these permanently shaded regions and you wouldn't want to be in there because it's really, really cold. Yeah, uh, but you can be on the crater rim with your solar panels collecting all the free solar energy you can, but right round the clock. If you're not careful, you, you're into a permanently illuminated region, which is probably yeah, terrible as well. But close enough to your water supply in the permanently shadow. You, you ideally want to be somewhere yeah. where you've got the opportunity to, uh, to make the best of, of both worlds. Yeah. But certainly, um, I mean, here at the Open University, one of our next challenges for space exploration is to build an instrument to, that's based on, on this kind of uh, device. Uh, and, um, and we're going to look for water and volatiles uh, at the poles uh, of the moon. And that's going to go on a mission called Luna 27, which should hopefully be launched in 2021. And we're, we're involved with designing and building the instrument as we speak. But I think from that to ultimate human habitation on the moon and, and uh, exploration and all that kind of stuff, I think it's great. I think it's, I think, you know, the next, I guess it's 50 years, but, you know, what a fascinating time it's going to be for those who can benefit from that. Yeah, I agree, by the way, with Ian, the poles are probably the best place. South Pole, I think, because of the South Pole Aitken Basin, but I'd put a base at the Lunar Poles. Final question to deal with uh, before we have to stop. One from Alexandra Gemmo or Gemmo. I'd like to know more about the volcanoes on Venus. Are any of them still active? If not, when were they last active? This is probably me. Or oh, you're looking keen. Do you want to go? Well, yeah, Venus, oh, another fascinating place because, you, you know, there's this blanket of cloud around it. You can't, you can't see anything optically. You have to use these other kinds of uh, techniques, radar in, uh, yeah. in particular. And um, uh, f from my memory of, uh, of missions that have been there, the, the, the feeling is that there are currently no active volcanoes, and yet there has been a, a volcanic activity in the geologically recent past. Definitely within the past few hundreds of millions of years, uh, Alexandra, which probably means that it hasn't finished for good, there will be more in the future. There's some dispute about um, short-term changes in the atmosphere which could be sulfur dioxide emissions from volcanoes not being proven. Uh, Venus is not a dead planet in the same sense as 
Mercury, Moon, Mars are. Not that they're completely dead, but it's not active in the same way that the Earth is. It maybe has bouts of intense volcanism every few hundred millions of years and gets completely resurfaced. Yeah. We're not sure, That's but there are plenty of, uh, of shield volcanoes, relatively steep features, there are large areas flooded by, uh, by, by long, very long lava flows and some strange lava carved channels. It's, it's, it's different to the Earth, which is what makes planetary science so fascinating. You see, p you see parallels and then you see so many differences which intrigue you even more than the parallels. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, Venus, uh, it is a bit hellish, isn't it? I, one, one can't imagine there's any life there, for instance. Um, some people can. They yeah. say up in the clouds where there's water yep. vapour, some bit sulfuric acid, but there's water as well. You could have, you know, plants floating around in the clouds. It rains sulfuric acid. It doesn't reach the ground. Mm, yeah. Because <laughs> it evaporates before it gets yeah, to the bottom. Yeah. So, very inhospitable place. But people have said, look for life in the clouds. No, and, <laughs> and, and, and as a target for future exploration, uh, I, I personally would be absolutely fascinated to get involved. It, it's such a challenging thing to do. Uh, the, the surface temperature is incredibly hot, you know, it'd be hot enough to melt lead if you were down on the surface. Yeah. Uh, the atmospheric pressure is very high. I mean, those are the kind of things that drive explorers. They, they love those kind of challenges. Yeah. We've used all our time up. Ian, thanks for giving it part okay. of your evening. No problem. Kate and Ben in the back room, thank you. And thank you for joining in and for all the questions we had in advance and have asked live. Um, we'll run another of these uh, sometime in November. Um, so for you watching uh, as future learners or S283 students, um, you, you can find out what's going on by joining one of the Facebook groups. That's probably your, your, your best way if you want to keep in touch and uh, watch another of these. So thanks everybody and, uh, and good night.